Dr. Jen, it's so nice to see you again. Yeah, it's so nice to see you too, Dr. G. I mean, I'm sorry we're talking about this topic, but it's so important for us to continue that conversation. So, you know, I think we have some yellow and red flags for us to talk about. So what do you think are some of the really important warning signs parents need to be looking out for? First, I just want to encourage parents that if they see what they think might be red flags, like my kid might be in danger now, don't be afraid. Don't worry about shame. Call. Call your psych emergency department. Call your kid's doctor. Call their counselor. But call until you get an answer and help, even if it's the middle of the night, even if it's a weekend, because it's much better to be wrong. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that parents are often, what I often hear in my practice, right, is that parents are really afraid that their kids are going to be mad at them. And I think it's really important that you'd rather have a kid alive and angry at you than and risk you that can you take have it. one that's dead. Right. You love them and you can take it. You can take being, them being mad at you. Yes. You did when you strapped them into their booster seat. You did when you made them get vaccines. Like, it's okay. Right. Um, but it's the yellow flags. What do you wish parents noticed when you see them in your practice that they just didn't realize was anything to be worried about? That we dismiss kind of problematic behaviors. I'm putting them in quotes because we'll talk a little bit more about them as typical teenage behaviors, you know, because so much of the things we're going to talk about is yellow flags. You could have a parent say to you, but they're just being a teenager. They're just being an adolescent. So I think the biggest thing we have to think about is if your gut is giving you information that something doesn't feel typical, we want to really address that as something to, to kind of ask questions about. You don't have to be an expert in diagnosis, but you are an expert in your child. And I want you to respect your expertise if something feels wrong, even something good. If your child surprises you, good or bad, they want to spend more time with you, they're cuddling more. Anything that surprises you, good or bad, should make you curious. What's going on here that I don't know? That's a big, like to me, probably the biggest yellow flag, right, is that sense of, What's different? What doesn't feel like the norm in our house? You're spending more time with us versus being in the room. You're being more focused and hyper-focused on something that you used to not be. Any of those kinds of things I think are super important. I also think one of the other um, yellow flags we certainly encounter is um, just that slight shift in mood, which some families, again, might attribute to, oh, it, you're just being an irritable teenager. Um, but I think that all of a sudden you're kind of more happy-go-lucky kid is less happy-go-lucky. And it, and it can be a matter of degrees, but it's that something feels off. Your radar on your kid is your radar on your kid better than anybody we know. And, and we're not asking different. you when you have, when your radar goes off to call the emergency room. We're no. saying if something seems different, ask your child. Yes. Notice them out loud, which by the way, feels good for them even yes. when they get annoyed with you. You're <laughs> seeing them, you're important yes. to them. So you say, hey, look, I'm just curious. I see this difference and I want to know more about what's behind it and how you're feeling and if you're okay. Yes. And I think, I think if that feels too much, how are you? And then just sit and don't accept the first answer or the second answer. Sometimes we might need three or four, you know, we get the fine and then we ask again and we get the eye roll and we ask again and then we get the exasperated mom or dad. But I think being like, no, really, I want to know how you're doing and then sit in that answer is so vital because I think we, we don't wait for that answer very often. We don't kind of, we ask it as a throwaway instead of a true genuine need. And the last thing I would say is what you just said is such an important point. We got to highlight it that sit with the answer instead of trying to fix it or trying to check it off your list. Um, one of the things I'll say to my kids when they give me a short answer is, okay, say more words. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Really listen, not with the expectation that you're going to come up with a plan or a solution in that conversation. You're just going to hear them and tell them that how they feel, however it is, matters to you. Yeah. And I think that's, that's you know, validation at its core, right? We want to validate their experience. And this is a challenging time. We are hearing it in every dimension, how hard this is, that the normal we all want or expect or are used to is not there. The isolation is a problem. So we're gonna, we can expect that there's gonna be an increase in depression and anxiety for so many young people. So keeping our finger on the pulse of that, having those open conversations, not shutting them down, encourages that to be ongoing. And, and the more kind of we can be proactive in this, the less we will have to be reactive on the other side, which I think is such an important thing. If we learned anything in this episode from these brave families, it's that asking and living with the discomfort of asking is so much better than not asking. 